Hello, thanks for staying after lunch and hopefully staying awake. If not, I won't judge you. I'm, I have a young child at home and I know how precious sleep can be. Um, speaking to the last speaker too, it was very ironic having him talk about the Internet of Things and the connectivity, because right now I'm still without power from the hurricane. And my way of checking if I've gotten power on is to check if my Nest system is still offline. <laughs> so I'm like, come on, darn it, they're not there yet. So there's other uses for those electronic devices as well. So, um, so I'm going to kind of talk about the, the talk previous to me also was relevant to some of the work that we do in terms of the data, leveraging the data standards and driving data standards and having that kind of data ready to go in systems because that's also something we're working at. Um, I'll talk about my group at SAS, which is working specifically in the life sciences area in that translational space. Um, mainly what I have is a group of statisticians and bioinformaticians and software developers that work to create software that allow everybody to leverage some of the more powerful analytic methods that are coming out, uh, especially in light of how much data we can now receive from different sources. So that's going to be the focus of my talk. Um, of course, this section is about diagnostics and data and drugs. So. Um, those are the three Ds, but there's also just so much other um, components to that D that is data, right? Um, everything is becoming data. And again, as the last speaker said, we got to make sure that we're using it to the full capacity that we can. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that area, about my group, um, and then some of the methods we've done and some of our, our a couple key case studies. One, a customer highlighting example of, I think, a good uh, goal of what we can do with data to uh, provide clinical action. Uh, and then another example of a research consortium that we've been a part of in looking at how well that data even works uh, in the clinic and in prediction. So it's kind of going at it from two different ways and just talking about that life cycle of data that gets created and how it gets used and what we hope that'll mean for the healthcare industry. Um, I'll probably go light on some of the sections in here and I might go quick through a couple slides that are on some of the more uh, statistical algorithm details. Uh, but with questions afterwards, you can ask me if you are interested in some of the nitty gritty details of the methods. But I think here the purpose should be talking a little more high level of why we need these methods and the benefit of having a variety of methods. Um, so we're all here, we all know what our goals are. We want to actually use data to make healthcare decisions, to make medical decisions. Um, and this goes in a lot of different ways, you know, it can be, especially in oncology, it's finding a gene that we know means that uh, they're not going to have it as severe a case, or finding a gene that means that we know this drug is going to work on them. Um, conversely, an area we've worked a lot in is trying to find signals and biomarkers and panels and things that will say, um, find these key biological characteristics that'll say that a subject might not be safe to take a drug. So our group has a product that focuses a lot on the clinical safety uh, of drugs as they're developed. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do with this data. So it's not just DNA or RNA, it's the microbiome, it's the uh, meth methylome, DNA methylation, it's everything, environment. It doesn't have to always just be that part of biological, but it's a way of taking this myriad of data sources and trying to use it to stop being so uh, reactive with our healthcare industry and try to be predictive and try to be proactive, right? We want to be able to develop things that we can uh, treat people before they even have the disease. So that's kind of what I'm focusing around with our, um, with our products, honestly. So uh, within SAS, SAS, as you know, is a huge company um, driving some of the you know, standards in terms of how to analyze data. Um, our group specifically, instead of just focusing on software development, uh, we're really trying to target um, research and development and tools for life, sciences, life scientists, engineers, um, scientists, people working with genomics data, or people working with clinical is the two areas that my group specializes in. 
So two of the products that I support are Jump Genomics and Jump Clinical. So genomics is very much of at that early stage translational data of discovery and um, prediction. So what can we look at that data? What patterns can we find in it? What does it tell us about the physical traits that we have in subjects or in plants or in any really endpoint? And our other product, which is newer, is the clinical product, which, as I mentioned, is more targeted towards looking at, uh, it's used heavily at, speaking to the last speaker, um, heavily at the FDA and PMDA as two of the regulatory agencies that are willing to admit that they use our software. Um, in fact, most of their medical monitors now are, are training, trained and using this tool to do clinical safety of data submissions. The reason being is, you know, speaking to the need of a data standard, we decided when we created this software that we were not even going to try to support anything besides CDISC data standard. And so in terms of, you know, the clinical data, we were just saying we, we were betting on it. And at first it was hard because we'd go and show people and be like, here's what our software can do. That's awesome. I don't have that data. Our data is not in that standard. Um, so the fact that regulatory agencies are really starting to push that data standard is great. But it's not just great for us as a software group. It's great for everybody because the reason we chose to make our software work like that is the application of analytic methods is so quick when you can have a standard across the data types, when you have controlled terminology. It takes all that just data cleaning and data integrity and data muck, you know, out of the picture as you get better and better data standards and allows you to make discoveries about the data much more quickly. Um, so our goal with those two products in mind now, we have this clinical trials based on a data standard versus our jump genomics complete kind of exploration discovery. We're trying to use them um, both internally as researchers and scientists, but also for our customers to merge those two areas together. We want to bring that science and that discovery into some type of generic, like into, into a panel or into a avenue to have standard results. So, you know, one of the areas we're really looking into is and excited about is the fact that the CDIS data standard has created a PGX domain and a, several genomics domain for pharmacogenomics. So um, hopefully that continues to help this whole translational field of biological knowledge to medical uh, action. So our group, uh, as I mentioned, we're not just developing software. We really do try to do as much research as our jobs allow. It's the fun part of our jobs, honestly. And between both our group and the customers that we support and collaborate with, we've had, with Jump Genomics alone, over a thousand research papers published with that. Um, and I'll mention here, most of my focus will be on some of the predictive modeling algorithms we've worked to develop to handle this data. But another big area that we've been focusing on is um, plant science. And, you know, some of our customers are doing such amazing transformative things to help improve not only yield and disease resistance, but the, uh, the health benefits and the vitamin content of plants to the point where it's kind of like a drug, you know? It, it goes to that idea of proactive medicine. If we can feed people better with, you know, less oversight of things with, you know, things that might give us further diseases, um, you know, increased vitamin E content in our oats is one of the things that we've worked with General Mills on. If we can do that, then they might not have so many health issues to go to the doctor with. So in a way, we're really, all of it is working towards that drug idea. And some of our, some of our collaborators are even thinking of doing clinical trials. You know, Cheerios has that message that says they're heart healthy. Well, they have to prove that. They can't make, you know, medical claims without showing that it does work. So data comes from all different places and applies to all different places. Um, one of the examples that we've had that I think is a good success story of how to use that analytic data to get to what we want is one where they were trying to develop a rapid uh, diagnostic test for people coming into the hospital with severe sepsis or suspected sepsis. And they wanted to look at the metabolite and protein structures to see if they could find a prediction panel that would tell them if they're going to die within the next 48 hours from sepsis and find out if based on their metabolite profile they could know is this one of those subjects that we have to get going on quick or you know is this something that we can check in regularly um, 
So it was a really, really cool example where they took, it was kind of this time measurements on entry. They, they had subjects coming in with suspected sepsis. And um, they wanted to take any information that is collected on entry, including biomarker um, panel where they have metabolites and proteins um, at admittance and then 24 hours later. And so they had a mixture of, after following these people of survivors, non-survivors, and then those that actually looked like they were having sepsis but didn't. Um, and they actually, it was very nice to see it. Our software is very visual. They used from end to end our software to look at the data, understand the patterns, see clusters of subjects, and then build a predictive model to see if people survived or not. And they're now working into trying to put that into production so that hospitals have an immediate scan, immediate panel, to try to tell them how should we proceed with treatment with this patient. So I think that's a good uh, example of what we want to be able to do with data. Um, but this paper was, again, they had to do all that research for us. The real, the real goal will be when we already have it. Like, we're very much in the discovery phase of making precision medicine work. I don't think we're in the execution phase quite as much. Um, but we're getting there, I think. So in terms of that, you know, we really is, we have, we have the technology and it's, every day we get the technology becomes better. Um, there's that pipeline of, you know, the upstream work with the data. The group, we, the focus that I work in is this area right here of the analysis, discovery, and building those predictions that we hope will be useful. But it's cyclic right now. So right now you have these large arrays or large panels and different populations of individuals and things work differently. So we're really always gonna continuously be in that discovery phase of what works and what can we productionalize into something that says, oh, well, we don't have to do a whole genome scan or whole exome scan. We are caring for this disease or for this certain drug development. These key markers are these key genes and we're gonna keep those as almost a stratifying information, hopefully at the most simple level, to help us drive the treatment of these patients. Um, so that's one of my kind of case studies of the success. Um, another research area that my group has been heavily involved with is um, the quality of this data. And not just the quality, but the predictive capacity of it. Um, we've been involved with what's called the MAQC. It's an FDA-led consortium looking at the quality of the arrays coming off of these tech new technologies. At the beginning, it was the microarray. Now, of course, we're at the SEQC level, which is the next generation sequencing. And the latest stage of that SEQC project um, was to really determine, are we getting anything, are we getting a bang for our buck with sequence data versus the microarray? Um, so that was kind of an interesting thing. And in terms of quality, there's definitely difference, differences. In terms of alignment algorithm, there's definitely differences. Um, but to kind of correlate it to what we also talk to on our clinical side, in our clinical side, we have a lot of things looking at quality of data. And the FDA even talks about quality of data that comes in. And I don't know if you're aware of it, there, there's a trend right now going from what's called 100% source data verification, meaning on-site every record has to be checked, to a more statistical monitoring approach where you try to find quality in terms of errors that actually matter. And the same is true with the gen gen genotyping and sequencing arrays, right? Um, in this case, we cared about the quality, but we wanted to see if that quality and the differences in that quality affected predictive performance. Could we actually make better predictions with this data with the newer technologies? Um, so the group, ad it's a very, very large consortium. In terms of our group alone, we used uh, several different analytical methods for trying to predict the outcome. So this is a neuroblastoma survival data set. And then we had both microarray and NGS data, um, about 40,000 microarray predictors to about 60,000 RNA-seq predictors. And we, um, our group specifically was one of several analysis teams. We applied several different methods, cross-validated that to try to find um, you know, a robust and re reproducible panel of signal that could pr predict this neuroblastoma survival outcome. 
So this is a interesting plot that came out and you know, in SEQC was kind of considered the, the last stage of it was kind of considered a flop because what they found out in terms of looking at factors that actually explain the differences or the variability in performance of prediction, the platform, next gen sequencing versus microarray, no effect. There was no difference in the predictive capacity of these two types of data. Even the site, the, the RNA seq pipeline and the normalization methods, those kind of things, did not matter. The interesting thing to us, especially as one of those, the only thing that had a highly significant difference in the predictive capacity um, and performance was who did the analysis. <laughs> so, I mean, right here you can see the, the two biggest effects, analysis team and the endpoints they used, and the and classification method, the type of method, the team that did it, and the size of the model that fit it. That was all that mattered in, in, in the variability of the performance. So it was a flop, but for us it was great. We're like, see, it's important on how to know how to analyze your data. Don't just throw it into the same method that you always use. There's always new methods. Um, and value those, those clinical development teams that you have or the biometric teams and the statisticians that you have to actually help you understand your data. Um, so for us, what we really saw is that the analysis and discovery and how to parse through and use that data was much more important than the technology platform that was used. Um, so if you guys still are using microarray data, don't be discouraged. I mean, you don't have to be on SEQC data. It doesn't have to be next gen seq. But I know everybody loves that. Um, but the other big thing about those technologies and about those methodologies is they should be methods that allow you to have integrative approach to your analysis. Um, nowadays, you rarely have just one source of data. You rarely just have DNA mutations, and that's all you're going to worry about. Um, you have DNA mutations and your exome, and now might be the microbiome, so you can structure that. Is, is that changing, or is that um, influencing the way things are treated? I just saw, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a new mother, so I'm still, I'm not on the active phase of trying to, like, lose all the rest of the baby weight and start working out like crazy, but I read about it, and I, <laughs> I'm at that stage. I go to the gym, and I, I, then I leave after not working out. I, I took a nap, actually, on a yoga mat once. Um, but I read an interesting article that was talking about how even, you know, your diet, the microbiome is structurally different for people that have different BMI, you know, and some of it can't be helped, and some of it has to be targeted at fixing that instead of just working out like crazy. So there's so many aspects to the data that you can collect on an individual or what lives in that individual that can um, help us actually get to that medical decision making based on personalized medicine. So uh, I'm going slow. So I actually won't focus too much on our methods, but one of the big area in terms of all the different methods that are out there, um, like that example I just said, we had 60,000 predictors. Well, we rarely do we get to have 60,000 subjects as well. So in terms of the statistical analysis, a big problem when you think of big data is when your predictors outnumber the number of samples you work with. This is called the P greater than N problem. And the problem with it is that if you aren't careful with, you know, 60,000 predictors and 10,000 subjects or even just 100 subjects, you can perfectly predict everything about those subjects if you use all those columns. And you think, wow, we got it. The problem is a new set of subjects come in and that model that you fit doesn't work at all. And that reason being is that you've done something which is called overfitting. You've perfectly fit to that data, but you don't have something that's generalizable that can be used. Um, so one thing that we work a lot with in our algorithms is how to filter through those prediction, predictions, uh, those predictors. You can use known biology factors. If you know you have certain genes or components that need to be in your model, you upfront try to pick those, but you do it in a way that while you're fitting your algorithm, you hold out parts of your data and you test. That's what's called um, cross-validation, right? model fitting. The idea is you try to develop these algorithms and fit these algorithms by applying filtering techniques and different methods, and then you pretend like you don't have a little bit of your data and fit it, and then try it on that data. And that's the true metric of how well your data is predicting for you that difference in when you pretend you don't have data and you can validate 
if you're getting what you actually want to be getting with it. Um, so, you know, that, that's an area we've been focusing on for several years. This, what we call it cross-validation predictive modeling uh, and model comparison. So you can actually get a distribution to tell you, okay, this model is fitting better, and it's including when I pretend I don't have some data to hold out and then test it. And there's several metrics for doing that. Um, this is just an, a slide I threw in there because it's something interesting we've been doing too. You know, as a software company, we don't always get data. Sometimes people, especially as data gets more and more secure and private, you know, they're like, oh, we want to handle this. And I'm like, can you give us our data? And no. Mm -hmm. So something we've taken as our creative outlet for how to help develop methods is um, crowdsourcing your data, <laughs> crowdsourcing your data analytics. And it works both ways. You know, from our side, we don't have data. So we go on to this site called Kaggle, or there's another one, uh, the Dream Challenges that we have also used, that are places where people that have a data analysis problem but don't know how to solve it, they have the data but don't know how to solve it, they can set up a challenge. They can set up a competition. And then data statisticians and data scientists can get that data and hone in on their own methods and tweak their own methods to see how well they can predict that problem. And, it's becoming really, really popular. I mean, it's starting to get productionalized where certain companies will put this out there in terms of how to determine the analytic methods they want to use. And uh, our group has been doing it. The director of our group has kind of become obsessed with this. And he hasn't gotten a first place yet, and he's really working on that first place. But the last challenge we did was actually a very integrated analysis of both gene expression, mutation, copy number, methylation, and the whole, the whole gamut where they were trying to look at effective drug combination treatments. Um, and we got second in that, so we're getting there. <laughs> um, just with a little bit left of the rest of my time, I do want to talk about some other new algorithms that are getting us much more closer to the clinic. Um, so we have that genomic discovery phase, that translational discovery phase. And from that, sometimes we'll get at some of those key predictors that we hope to go forward with and execute in the clinic. Um, one of the analysis types that has become popular um, for multiple reasons, it, it has also gotten a little bit of a bad rap from some, is what's called subgroup analysis. Um, many of the colleagues I know at the FDA and, and at Big Pharma say the days of finding some big time drug that's going to work for 90% of the population, they're gone. You know, we don't find that anymore. Um, what they find is they can find a drug that if they hone in on a certain characteristic of a certain population, it can work for them really well. Alternatively, it can help determine a certain population where it should never be used, right? So there could be severe safety uh, endpoints. And it might still be a good drug, but certain people respond in a negative way. If we can track and understand and categorize that response and and explain it, then, I mean, that's where label indications come from. So subgroup analysis is a new area along that. And one of the ways to think about that really is trying to find subjects that you are most likely to respond to that treatment. Or in, instead of, in, if you're not thinking of efficacy, those that are least likely to be hurt by that treatment. So these two circles are the areas we care about, right? You know, if, if you, with the treatment, if you didn't improve, and whether you're treated or not, well, then that's not a case we care about. But what we want to try to find out is, can you find that people that, if they're treated, they actually will improve, or that group of, if they're not treated, they'll get very much sicker. Um, so a lot of tree models are being used for this, and this is where our biological indicators can really come in. Pretty much what this does is there's a lot of different method, methods. Instead of just looking for a treatment response now in our drug, we look for a significant interaction effect. So the idea is, is there a significant treatment and some other variable interaction that's driving the groups of these subjects? Can we find that and then hone in on that group that will perform well? Um, so several of the methods we've been working on lately are along that idea, and I can talk more about those if you want. Um, another one that's just a different variety of a method using this forest trees is where we actually simulate counterfactual data and you actually treat each person as their own control too. And so they 
develop these treatment um, plans where they can say, let's pretend what would happen to this patient if they were on both treatment sides, the, the control or on the drug, and see how that would, how that would fall out in terms of significance of um, outcomes, adverse events, or other clinical indicators of success, progress. Um, another method along the same idea it moves us into the more observational space. So it doesn't have to always be in, in clinical trials that we're looking at these kind of uh, subgroup determinations. Uh, local control is a method where you just look for effectiveness of a treatment across subpopulations based on just unsupervised clustering. So it's a way of just trying to say, okay, if I dynamically try to change my groups of people, do I suddenly get a high treatment effect, a significantly high treatment effect in one people, uh, in one group? Um, this does have a lot of you know critici criticizers to this. There's a lot of naysayers to this, and I can understand it because one of the concerns we always have is you know the, the saving orphan drugs or trying to repurpose something. But at the same time, um, you know it's not always just about the money. It's about finding that small group of people that hopefully we can treat and help. Um, and then I also will just give a plug for a different idea in terms of uh, an area lots of people are working towards when they have biological inf input. There's that subgroup identification, which is trying to find the right patients for a given drug. And then there's also what's called optimal treatment regimes, which is another area, which is given a patient, what's the best drug to give them? It's kind of the flip of subgroup. Um, and what it does is it uses biological metrics to create a propensity for effectiveness of a certain drug. And then that model can be used in building the predictive model of if that treatment really is going to help. Um, so that's just another area we've been doing. But basically, all of these methodologies, all of this discovery, all of these patterns, looking for patterns and understanding is getting us hopefully to an end goal in precision medicine where companies can have this, right? They want to have their health data integrated and actionable. Um, both the scientific data as it comes in and the clinical data, hopefully in a data standard, that it can go into this database where we can query and create on the go, you know, Internet of Things actions um, on the data that we've been collecting. And like, like, again, like the speakers before me said, those that I was able to catch, um, we're getting the data. We have to actually use it now. So... Um, with that, I will uh, finish up, and this is my team. Russ, Russ Wolfinger is the director of our group, and the rest of us are uh, his little minions. So, <laughs> but happy to take any questions.